Are you an indie author wondering what the hot niches are going to be for 2019? Where the next best sellers are going to pop up? Well, stick around. I'm going to talk about that with Alex Newton from Klytics. So a word of warning. This is not just one video. When you get two nerds together talking about data and markets and supply and demand, sometimes it ends up being a two-hour conversation. So to spare you, I've broken this down into pieces. And if you're really interested, you can plow through it all because, quite frankly, I think it's all pertinent information if you're an author and you're really serious about finding out how to use data to drive your business of writing. Hey everybody, it's Joe Solari here from the Business of Writing. And today I'm here with Alex Newton from Klytics. Hey Alex. Hey, nice to meet you. Hello everybody. <laughs> All right, today we're gonna give you a breakdown on the book market in 2019. Alex has done a lot of work. He's been up late putting together some uh, great content for you. This one's gonna be a blockbuster. Um, a little bit of background, though, what got me so interested in what uh, Alex is doing is uh, my background. I've shared it a few times that in the past, I had a business that was doing pricing analytics. And how we made money was we were able to take data from our customers and create models of the marketplace. And um, it was a niche in uh, consulting business. and what Alex has done is he's really kind of blown that up and t taken all this data that he can scrape out of, off of Amazon to give you a true picture of what's going on in the marketplace. And the other thing I think, um, you know, I've, I've had a couple people ask me or I hear in the halls talking about this and some of the other products. Um, what Alex is going to talk about is completely different than something that you're doing with a tool like KDP Rocket. Okay, and I'll let Alex talk about it in a second, but you know, KDP Rocket, which is a great tool to help you um, find relevant terms for your specific books and to make sure that they market well, that isn't, um, well, it's kind of looking at the same data that Alex is playing with, it's completely different than what we're talking about here because what Alex is doing is he's taking the basics of economics, of supply and demand, and drilling into it and slicing it and dicing it in ways that haven't been possible until now. Right? Right. Uh, very interesting way of putting it. And uh, yeah, I mean, first of all, you know, let's uh, give a big shout out to Dave and KDP Rocket, which, which is like a super great product. I mean, Dave is uh, great at the far frontier of our industry to helping uh, to helping authors, and I think he has a great tool. And um, many of my clients, you know, we work hand in hand with you know you using technical KDP Rocket or other tools keyword tools, uh, but I would wholeheartedly recommend KDB Rocket for tactical keyword planning. And also he has elements in it, which is about where to fish. But I, I had one client say, it's so funny, you know, Alex looks so much into where to fish, so where to fish for a fish in the pond, and, and uh, Dave and his tools help uh, with how to fish, you know, how to catch the fish in the end and have the best ads and best keywords, etc. So, um, you know, it all comes together and the, the, the whole common denominator is let's use facts, figures, data to better compete in the marketplace. That's mm. what it's all about. And uh, today I'm, I have the pleasure to potentially come in a bit more from a helicopter view and then we're going to drill deep in market niches and all these sort of things in a, in a fun way, I hope. Sure, sure. And, you know, I think when, when it comes to data, you know, it used to be that people looked for asymmetrical data, right? That they had data that other people didn't have. And I think one of the things that's happened in the 21st century, um, I don't know what kind of term you would give it, but it's now the data is there and what they suffer from isn't that they can't get data, it's their laziness in using the data. Right. And if you're prepared to do the work and look at this stuff, you can you can essentially create asymmetrical data. Right. Just out of because you're determined to actually learn about the market and then use that in your decision making process for your business. 
That is very right. And I think what we suffer from today is not a lack of data. It's, it's basically the overkill of mm. data and information. But whichever tool you use to, and very often uh, tools and data are created by geeks and not necessarily, like myself, <laughs> and not necessarily by the people who use it. Now, you and I, we spend time uh, of our career in corporate consulting. And I always kept saying, you know, CEOs, corporate CEOs, they don't have much time. They don't have a big attention span. They're a bit like kids there. And <laughs> we always say in consulting, if, if your analysis, if your data, first of all, data, nobody's interested in data. People are interested in information and insight. So that's the first conversion process you have to do with the data. Mm. And then the insights have to be con conveyed in a way that um, we kept saying, Corporate CEOs, kids, and grandmothers have to be able to understand it because they form all one group. So my, my attempt today is to make everything we cover very palatable and um, hopefully, you know, get a good discussion going and help all the authors and publishers who are, who are watching. Great. Well, you know, I why don't we just start plowing into it? I Good stuff. You know, let me share the screen and we're going to do the screen share here on and off. All right, so uh, you should now be seeing a, um, a slide deck with a, with a nice face. I think the guy is called Alex Tinkle. That's myself. Do you yeah. see it? What was that when you graduated from uh, your MBA? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that that was uh, well. It's funny enough. I when I started the business, I thought oh, I thought let's never wear a suit again. But I couldn't find any headshot of me without a suit. <laughs> so that, that's certainly something I have to fix. Well, without further ado, let let's dive right into it. So um, agenda-wise, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, about authors, publishers, and what it means to operate in the market. Now, market will have two sides, as you see, the supply of books and the demand of books. We're going to look at uh, uh, these two things. Then we're going to talk a little bit about sales ranks and data and how do you actually get the data um, if you're an author or publisher. And then everybody has been waiting for this, you know, what's the news on hot genres, hot niche markets, and... And uh, I'm sure we're going to have a good discussion here and get that going anyway. So the, the first thing is when, when we looked at the data, authors, publishers, and the market is when you talk to the typical writer and, and author, you know, typically they write, I think, for three reasons. One is to have a passion for something, like the guy here uh, has a passion for volcano photography. <laughs> and he 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 pop that person could possibly couldn't care less about the money he makes. There is like a very strong passion for something. So you may have a very strong passion for a certain genre, for a certain subject, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. And I think that is one of the key pillars of success, right? But at some point in time, especially if you want or have to pay your bills as a writer, the money enters into the equation as a motivation. Now, the other thing, what some writers write for, when they write a book, it's not necessarily for the money in the first place, but especially in nonfiction, you have people who write for the sake of building authority, right? So they yeah. say, hey, I'm here, the number one guy in how to invest in the stock market or how to grow bonsai trees. And the Kindle book doesn't sell very much, but it has this orange bestseller badge. They prove their authority, and then they earn all the money elsewhere, whether it's with courses, information product, YouTube channel, uh, you name it. Mm -hmm. So I, well, I think the sweet spot just, just comes one together point. where you have all the three. Well, one quick point on that also is, is that with the authority piece is people are starting to realize that Amazon is a search engine. So if where do people go to learn? So a lot of, yeah, they go to Google to find certain things. But if you're looking to get uh, into a topic, it's a way for if you are an authority in something for people to find you. And it's a pretty well classified system with the niches they have. Absolutely. And the other thing is if you apply for a job, you know, people may, may even go on Amazon, the employers, not go on only on social media and LinkedIn. But uh, look, do you have any books on Amazon, etc.? Or even check, you know, if you claim in your resume, your C V that you yeah. are an author, you know they might want to check out how, how the books are doing. So very important. Now, I know people will at this very point say there are 15 other reasons why you write a book. And I know uh, that some of people say, well, they write for therapeutic reasons or just because they have nothing else to do. 
but that is not our focus here um, today. Especially today, we're going to look about that part of the motivation that pays your bill, the money motivation. And the, the point I'd like to convey is, I think there is academic de definition for when are you a writer versus when are you an author, but you know, you write something, articles, books, whatever, at some point they get published and you're an author. Or if somebody wrote them for you and you had the idea behind it, you, you are the author of that very idea. Now, in our terms, in your channel, we talk to a lot of indie authors. And obviously, independent author means that you're independent, independent from publishing companies, you upload your own book, you do a lot of your own marketing. And what people usually don't say, see, however, as soon as you use the very term in the author, you are automatically the publisher. And that's where usually the thinking stops. Yeah, I'm an indie author, I'm an indie publisher, whatever you want to call me. But as soon as you say you're in a publisher, you are in for a business, you are a business. And also it doesn't stop there. As soon as you are a business, you usually want to generate revenues at the least amount of cost to turn a profit. Now once you turn a profit, you're usually not alone because other, one, other people want to do so too. So you are part of a market, in this case, the book market. There are market forces, as we call them in, in economics, right? Mm, and today we're going to look at a bit at what are the forces that you are exposed to and how can you hopefully use them to your advantage. That, that would be my mission today. Yes, yeah, that's something that um, the folks that are really serious about growing their business um, around this need to understand that these you know these these are forces that um, are in every market exactly right so let's have a look at those forces and before we jump into that very one that's a slide I, I usually show in talks because either you get people interested by saying hey if you're in there for the money they, they start listening but you have some artists who say no 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 I'm not looking at numbers or I cannot look at numbers. Well, tell you what, if you, if you look at the arts, mathematics have been very closely connected to the arts and numbers. If you look at the works of Leonardo da Vinci, The Last Supper, The Mona Lisa, words like the golden ratio, the mathematics of, uh, or divine proportion, the mathematics of perspective, just to say great artists don't necessarily shun away from numbers. And as a, as a business person, you shouldn't sh shy away from numbers in, in any way whatsoever. And where science meets the arts, you know, sometimes some interesting things can happen. So uh, that just as a humble word of introduction when it comes to numbers and the arts. Now, we've been talking about market forces, market what, you know. Uh, now, I don't want to give you an economics lecture at all. But very simply speaking, market forces in the book market, um, market forces is, is very simple. There is a demand for a book. There are readers out there who want to buy and hopefully read your book. And there's a supply of books, you authors and publishers who every month churn out the pages and you know publish, publish the books. And market forces are basically, you have situations where you know here on the left-hand side, Demand is weighing in a bit too strongly where you suddenly have um, whole new trends come up, whatever. Those days when Fifty Shades of Grey hit the yeah. hit the theaters and all of a sudden every you know, every woman who was up to then reading clean and wholesome whatever Amish romance, excuse my words, now wanting to have this, you know, soft, you know, wow, what is this? And <laughs> so many readers coming in. And, you know, for a certain time, there were many readers who cannot get enough of it and too few authors to serve them. Now, very soon, you know, you had people jump onto the bandwagon and, you know, you had all these, all these billionaire romance novels come in there, which then led at some point in time, there was an equilibrium between, you know, the number of books being read and the number of being, books being published. But very soon you had a situation we have, you, you, we have a super big supply of books. I think you could go on Amazon right now and search for billionaire romance, mm. whatever. There are 35,000 search hits or something, right? right. And well, at the that, same that, time. 
And in that, there's now subcategories of billionaire romance, right? Like it, yeah, and, and then it, it gets into finer granularity, and we come to these strategies in a minute. You know, yeah. how do you then, from one market, get into okay, let's talk about whatever paranormal billionaire romance, you know, <laughs> niche it for the yeah. town. Um, so, but the the gist being that there are not enough readers out there to buy the demand uh, those books out there that come online every month, and there you have a situation where life can become uh well either you say what's the, the books are not very price elastic now in any other industry here if this if the right hand side was the car industry and you had too much supply of cars two things would be hap either happen either you have the car dealers lower the prices and give you the big discounts to get the cars out of the dealership because then suddenly more people more demand is being generated as more people are prepared to buy the now cheaper cars, or if you're not able to lower your cost to, to bring these prices down, you have some supply going out of business as a car manufacturer may go bankrupt, as we've seen in the last 50 years as well. Now, with book authors, it's, it's a bit different because there's only so much you can lower your price, and also on the reader side, prices are not that elastic, you know. Um, but you will incur more costs because if you have such an oversupply of books, you you can argue that, well, the supply of books is actually only determined by the first two, three pages of search results in Amazon. So it's a very scarce supply if you really look at it. But to be part of that supply, you have to incur a high cost, in that case, advertising, to be part of that game. So, so much for the theory. You know, how does this now look in practice? when you uh, look at the Amazon Amazon market. And since Amazon just closed its annual numbers, um, let's talk about the supply of books, books here first. We've been following this now for the last five years. And you have to face the fact that the supply of books is Amazon has very much become like a library of Congress because they don't necessarily take books offline. So you have like 5.4 million English books in the Kindle wow. store. They stop. Yeah, they stopped displaying this number, but they still show like the monthly increments that so we kept tracking it. So this is the most accurate number we could get here for uh, the 1st of February 2019. So that is the supply of books. And But guess what? Every month, there are 70,000 new titles added to the Kindle platform every month. Some crazy 74,000 titles, 69,000. It's always around the average of 70,000 titles and that has been the case up and down for the last five years. In fact, 2018 we've seen an acceleration. Now if you look at um, that number, it's like 18% growth in book supply over the last year. Now the big question, has the demand for ebooks, has, has that also increased by you know double digit every year? Hmm, bit of a question mark. We'll look at the numbers in a very second. Mm -hmm. But this is the situation that authors and publishers are facing. The, new, the influx of new books is relentless, right? And, yeah, with this situation, you then ask, well, okay, that's the overall market. Uh, what is the supply by each and individual genre? And this is an interesting picture as well because here we sort of, if you just take the main 30 categories of the round about 7,000 sub, 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 categories. <laughs> this would just be the top picture. So they are sorted in descending order, starting with the smallest category. So just imagine even the smallest main category in Kindle is being the law category. with 68,000 Kindle books about law, ranging from maritime law to whatever law. Mm. And that... Uh, so the technical stuff tends to be less competitive. If you take the two umbrella categories, we currently count about 2.5 million nonfiction book titles, so more competition in nonfiction than in literature and fiction, which stands here at 1.8 million titles. And what is very interesting, the largest, the next level down genre from a supply point of view is actually religion and spirituality. Hmm. Um, very interesting. People want to share their solutions and people search for solutions in life. 
romance, well, sex sells, <laughs> children's ebooks. That is a funny one because we made an analysis of, of what is actually selling. Children books are not ebooks are not, not selling at all. Yet every excuse me, John Dick and Harry thinks he can upload a Kindle children's book, um, but they will never get read, right? And then, yeah. And money tiles history sci-fi sci and you can read the chart it's you know that is the overall situation and we will dive um, dive into much more detail as we go along here and and um, just to just to be clear what we're saying what you're saying in this this isn't that these books are selling this is that people are putting them out exactly and in m many a genre there is a large mismatch between what people put out versus <clears throat> what does the average Kindle reader actually want to read? Because there are also demographics evolved about people who own reading apps or Kindle devices. I mean, if you sit in an airplane in the US, look who has a Kindle device in his hands. I guess estimated 65% uh, female, uh, probably older than 50 years. And from that, you can deduct what's being read, as you will see in a minute. So um, also for the fun part of it, where's the highest influx of new titles? And that is exactly where that mismatch occurs. For example, we have business and money titles, which grew by 43% in supply over the last year, where many traditional publishers put up their backlists online, and you find still so many junk books where people you know, think I make a fortune with how I earned my first Ferrari type of book, although they never drove a Ferrari in their life, but I think they can write a book about it. Um, LGBT books, 28% growth, a lot of influx. Um, I mean, the whole gender discussion has obviously helped, and obviously people reading LGBT romance in the anonymity of having an ebook device. Romance plus 23%. And uh, the other big category, sci-fi, History thrill is suspended more in line with the, with, the, with the market average, right? So that is the biggest influx. But, you know, from 550,000 titles, book supply, and religion, you came down to the other end of the spectrum where you have a supply of zero. There are bestseller lists. Now, if you go online, online right now, I think there's one diet author who, who saw a presentation of mine and put, in, uh, put his book into that category. But when I did the analysis, there is a bestseller list such as Kindle eBooks, photography, uh, sorry, arts and photography, photography, travel photography, Far East, and Amazon tells the person who browsed, sorry, there is no bestsellers available in this category. Please check back later. So, you, it goes from 500,000 to a supply of zero, and you have all uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, pun intended, in between. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good one. All right. So um, if, if this is a supply of books, you know, what, what happened here to the demand of books? Here it becomes more interesting. Now, Amazon does not publish um, their book revenue nor their ebook revenue. The last time they published anything was a quote in Forbes five, four years ago, where at the time they said they made $5.2 in revenue with books. And uh, there was at the time a presentation by Russ Graninetti at the time, the VP of Kindle at Frankfurt Book Fair when they showed the graph where after three years, Kindle sales, Kindle ebook sales surpassed the Amazon print book sales, not in value, but in volume terms. So we have to work a little bit with indicators. One indicator is clearly when it comes to ebook demand, the ongoing uh, Kindle ebook growth, the growth in the Kindle global select fund, right? So ever since they started paying um, about a, you have to know about a third of the books are in Kindle Unlimited of those five million we talked about. And these books um, are enumerated per page read out of the global pot. And that pot has grown by 20% year on year, every year since 2016. By now, cumulative is $860 million that has been paid out in royalties to Kindle Unlimited, Kindle uh, ADP select authors. Now, if you assume 
that the books not, not necessarily get longer or Amazon is suddenly throwing money to the authors or the, the remuneration per page read is changing or doubling, you know, you can assume that that is an indicator of continued ebook ebook growth. And that is the view of Amazon, right? Now, just last week, the American Traditional Publishers Association, they also published their numbers. Um, they have a different take on the whole picture. So what you see here is the US trade consumer book publishers revenue as published last week by the AAP. And overall, they're happy, I guess, because their overall revenue grew by 4.6%. But uh, the red, dark red one here, that is ebook. The first thing you see for them, ebook is not so important. In fact, they don't want it to be important because it cannibalizes potentially the print sales. And you see the big money they make in hardbacks and in paperbacks. That's where their revenue comes from. Mm. So for them, the ebook sales shrank by 3.6%. So it's basically stagnant, slightly going back. That has been the case for the last two, three years for them, right? So, what do we take from it or us as indie authors? Well, most of us are published by Amazon and there are, there's two major problems with this declining number here is the sample is about 1,100 traditional authors excluding Amazon and Amazon is claimed to have about 80% of the ebook market share in the US. So I would probably go more with that number than with that number. Mm -hmm. And the final indicator we have, have which is big news, but also something to look at by indie publishers here in, in our community is that um, this is the picture I also showed in, in Vegas where we looked at the, the, the top 100 bestsellers on Amazon are not print bestsellers, they are book bestsellers, they are cross format. So if you go through them, you even find Kindle books on there who, who, which don't even have a print edition. So you can, for every genre, like romance, for example, 93% uh, of the top 100 titles, not in the Kindle bestseller list, the book bestseller list of Amazon are actually Kindle editions that are up there in the top 100. Um, for mystery, thriller, suspense, it's around three quarters of the bestseller list. So in literature and fiction, sci-fi, it's about 66%. So this is the penetration of a format in the top selling uh, part of the market, which is really generating the revenue, the top 100s, right? Right. right. So, so just before we even go into the details, look at this. This is the format share in 2017, and this is the format share in 2018. We go back once more, 2017, 2018. Well, I see two things. I see the red area growing, which is Kindle editions, and I see the blue area growing, mm. which is audio, right? So, and the green, it, the blue the, area. Wow. Yeah. yeah that's crazy. The, the blue area is the one where the traditional publishers and, and the indies agree, or this data, Amazon data agrees. Also, the traditional publishers, if you look at their numbers, going back here once more, um, the blue is their audiobooks, and they now represent also 500 million in sales, million dollars, and it grew by 37% in the last year. So I think that is something, at least something, the, the industry agrees on all across the board. Mm. So you, and, go you, ahead. Yeah, uh, you may get into this later, and if it needs to be tabled, that's cool. Um, but when watching this, like one of the things that, thinking about the data you're presenting now and some of the things I've seen recently. So I, I saw a presentation from um, traditional publishing about the science fiction marketplace and the data that they were using conflicts with like the stuff that you've put together and the stuff that um, like author earnings puts together where you're actually showing growth in those markets. But then, well, at least in the, in the, in the penetration, yeah, there's some in, implicit growth in the, in the ebook market of that market. That's what, what's in Right. So like you're showing there's actual growth in that market. If you look at the author earnings data, they would, they would um, disagree with like the Nielsen data and say, no, actually that genre of uh, science fiction and fantasy is growing, not contracting. Okay. 
And then, but one of the things that I've observed, like because of these two things coming together, and this gets to be a supply and demand uh, issue that I think is relevant for some authors, is that maybe in the past, if you were a sci-fi reader, it was hard to find books you haven't read. Now you're finding that there's more and more books to read. And also because of like what you've shown is the amount of books that are being produced in a particular genre, the competition in this particular segment, it's like military science fiction, is getting tougher because now I have the ability to pick two or three authors that I enjoy reading their books and they have a big backlist. So I'm, I'm interested to hear how um, you, know, you can see some of those things in the data and, and help some of these authors understand you know, deeper into those you know, subgenre um, supply and demand issues. Yeah, and we're going to look at exactly in, into that for, for some of the genres, in, including sci-fi. And uh, you're completely right. Well, I'm not arguing that, you know, literature, uh, sorry, sci-fi is necessarily growing or shrinking. You really have to look at the format and at the, and at the sub-genres. But um, I just look at the top 100s over the last um, couple of months. I think, yeah, sci-fi has been going a little bit down, uh, actually, over time. But it... If we, what we will see later, it really depends on the subgenre. So you can jump on a certain bandwagon within the major genre, and you couldn't care less what the overall market is doing for sci-fi and, and fantasy. Um, perhaps the the last point here on the overall the demand situation, if we if we move on here, is well, two two points. First of all, and this is why also all the advertising strategies. Uh, have become so important. Well, with the market saturating more and more, I think this is no secret. People talk about visibility and all the things, but all the numbers behind it, if you do some estimates and calculations, out of those 5.4 million English titles, more than 6 million in total, the sales ranks, one to 50,000 of those, make almost like, you know, make 80 87% or more mm -hmm. of the complete market. Now, a professional authors, and I know many of the big shots may also be watching this, you know, yeah, if, you, if you're in the top 500, in the top 1,000, we are really talking top 2,000, 3,000, you have to have a 5,000, you have to have a whole number of books, you know, that are constantly up there. Uh, once you drop to 50,000, you know, it's no longer as exciting because you have only whatever two, three downloads a day at maximum or something like that. So... That is where you have to be. But the, the overall situation right now is we looked at the top 24,000 titles over three months, and there's a sales rank information for the books. You can infer a little bit, you know, what is the equivalent revenue potential in such a sales rank for KU and, you know, times the price for the non-KU share you typically have in that genre. And you can aggregate all the royalties being earned across that at least the top bit of the market. So the conservative estimate, if you take only those books where you don't even have a publisher name or publishers with two, two authors in the database at maximum, so where you can claim probably very small publishers, indie publishers, and that's not even including the big cooperatives like the Andalies of the world. I'm not even sure whether Mark Dawson's and these type of guys are in there. So, um, at least I know Andrew's company is not. So it may even be a conservative estimate. But if you add all the indies there together, we have a market share. They represent right now the single biggest entity capturing share in that market. Yeah. Out having outgrown the big five and all their hundreds of imprints. The one thing to watch is Amazon imprints. They are taking share fast and rapidly, so they are at nineteen percent now. But you know, first of all, congratulations to all of us here who, who are watching and who are writing and who are indies. You know, indie authors, you guys rock. So you know, keep keep it up. Mm. Yeah, and I I know of quite a few folks either I'm working with directly or indirectly that are in you know all intents they're they're a publishing company because it's not just their books. They're, um, they're doing anthologies and they're doing uh, co-writing and it, it, it's under I mean, a, a great example of this is, um, you know, uh, the four horsemen universe that Chris wow. Kennedy and um, uh, Mark Wannerly have come up with, 
right? It's not just those two guys writing together. It's they write on their own. They bring other people in. Um, it's a really cool collaborative thing that didn't exist in the past. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's, you know, I think it's still, yes. Is, is the gold rush still there from 10 years ago? Probably not. Or it is still there, but it has shifted, you know, from like 10, five, five to 10 years ago, you had all this gold rush about let's upload my grandmother's cookbook and hope that I make a fortune, which nobody did. Mm. And then soon people learn, well, the money is actually in fiction on Kindle. And then you have now all the people jumping in. But as I said, we're talking about markets and market have market forces, supply and demand. Good quality, high quality books, well marketed, will prevail. And the, the system regulates itself in the end. And in the course of it, some people will lose. And some of the big indies, you know, who really work at it seriously like a business and like being both an artist and a business, they obviously thrive. Well, that's it. I, uh, markets and competitors mature. And I think that um, you look at the, the people that we know that are in the industry, um, you, could, you could take this data that you look at and say, oh, that's all nice, Alex, but, you know, I, it's really about the book. Well, that, that in some part and parcel is true. Like if it's not a good quality book, not just in the content of the story, but of the, you know, the quality of the cover and the editing, if you don't have that, it's, that's product. That's a product issue. But the thing is, right. and, and certainly it's not a competitive issue. Like we're trying, they're going to take your share, but you'll do better in the marketplace if you understand the, the headwinds and the tailwinds, right? Um, if you want to go up against the headwinds, then great, do that, but it's going to be harder. You want to figure out where there's some tailwind, then it's going to propel you where you want to go. Exactly. And I think the whole purpose is find those parts of the book market where uh, we have a, where a couple of things come together in you know, a headwind, tailwind, whatever you call it. But first of all, it's your passion factor that is combined with a certain skill set and craft skills. You have to be a good writer. Uh, sometimes knowledge enters in. You know, if you want to write legal thrillers, I mean, you compete with guys who really know the legal system inside out and can write in that genre. So there is knowledge and there is passion, knowledge and craft skill, and now start marrying that with hopefully a market where the demand and supply equation is at least at equilibrium, but not you know a completely flooded market where you can be the very best author and most passionate and most skillful and most knowledgeable, knowledgeable author in the nonfiction genre about the mating behavior of Chinese vineyard snails. Great. But you're not going to earn a lot of money because, um, well, your one book will probably already outgrow the demand for it. You get the idea. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, that, that's a bit where we're going. So, you know, from here, let's um, let's move on into uh, into the realm of of the how do you get the Amazon data and how do you how do you find your niches and where the and then we're basically going to open the vault and and show you some of the real data as it's as it's happening right now. So let me just. So that ends the first part of what we discussed. There is another video that follows on right from where we left off that you can jump on and continue to hear what we talked about, where we dive super deep into some different niches and talk about fantasy and science fiction and romance and a bunch of different categories that will help you to understand the power of using this type of a market analysis to make better informed decisions about how to position your book in the marketplace.